But uh, good morning to every single one of you. Um, it is a privilege for uh, myself and my wife to be here with you this morning. This is our first church service. Our church hasn't yet gone back, uh, but this is our first church service since about the middle of March, and it is wonderful to be with God's people. As Jared mentioned, my name is Kyle Tamblin. My wife over there is Amy. She is not my better half. She is the best half of our relationship. I am the pastoral assistant, and I help with the youth and young adult ministry at Honey Ridge Baptist Church. Uh, I bring greetings from Honey Ridge, and I thank Gavin and your elders and all of you for allowing me to join you this morning in worship and to bring God's word. It's especially a pleasure to be in the church which planted the church that I have been such a rich benefactor of uh, for my entire life. I've been at Honey Ridge for my entire life, for 28 years, and it is a blessing to know that this is the church which planted Honey Ridge Baptist Church. And it's a wonderful blessing for me to be with you this morning as we worship. We have a, a very long passage to go through this morning. It's going to be a, a long drive, but I believe that one of the advantages of expositional preaching, the kind of preaching which attempts to look at God's Word as God's Word, is that we can take each book of the Bible and see how it was written and really understand what the author was wanting us to see in God's Word if we read it as it was written. So what I'd like us to do is not to take a microscopic deep dive into a verse or two words, but we're gonna look at over a chapter this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna dive right in. Won't you turn to Mark chapter four and verse 35. Mark chapter four and verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And there were other boats with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great fear, and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obeys him? They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately they met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs, on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send, send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told, and told it in the city and the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had a legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
And he went away and began to proclaim at the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And when Jesus crossed again into the boats onto the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was, a man, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no, no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing about you, yet you say, who touched me? And he looked, about, he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking there, came from, a ruler, came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all aside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita, kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the little girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray before we continue. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know that by your spirit we are able to understand because you delight in teaching your people about you. We ask that you would illumine our minds to understand this text this morning, that we would know the power of the gospel and that we would trust in your words, truthfulness and in your ability to speak to us. So teach us now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we join in at this point, and this text really takes us almost right to the beginning of Jesus' ministry amongst the people in this area. Now at this point, it is early on in the ministry, but Jesus is facing immense trial, temptation. He is facing his own set of storms, and the people around him are accusing him of being demon-possessed. The Pharisees are mocking him. His own family has deserted him, and he is tired. So Jesus, this exhausted man, tells his disciples it is time to continue on to the other side of the lake. We catch up in verse 37 where we see that a great windstorm arose and it tossed the disciples in the boat around like a can of sardines. The wind was howling over the lake. The crashing waves made rags of the disciples. And yet in the corner at the stern on the cushion, we find Jesus asleep. The kind of sleep that no doubt young mothers with young children will understand, an exhausted kind of sleep. In the middle of this crazy storm, the disciples, with all the chaos around them, find their teacher asleep. Mark makes an important note here that Jesus' humanity is extremely clear. No doubt, body and mind were tired, and he had been subjected to every form of insult, mockery, and attack. But here he is, asleep. And Mark wants us to see this because his posture is not so well accepted by his followers. 
His disciples come to Jesus at the end of their rope, completely unable to fix the situation they find themselves in, and what are their words? Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? Jesus wakes, and he faces the storm, and he speaks to the storm. And the storm comes to a complete halt. Now don't get confused, the storm didn't come to a complete halt because it was done. The storm stopped at Jesus' words, and the Greek wording here really helps us to understand what is going on. The word cease here is that it means that the storm was tired from its labor. Notice the contrast. Even the power of nature itself is completely tired, is shattered at the very words of Jesus. Jesus, this tired teacher, this preacher of the gospel, asleep on the boat, his humanity But then at the same time, this Jesus, strong and authoritative, controller of nature, his divinity. The disciples had no way of knowing that this storm was chosen by God and set forward by God in order to teach them about who he is through the power of Jesus. Now let let us stop there for a moment and ask, how does it make you feel that God is able to use storms, trials, difficulties in order to teach you about who he is through his power and not your ability to go through them? Does it comfort you knowing that even when we are full of uncertainty during times of COVID, financial crisis, and other means, does it comfort you to know that the great power that we give to these situations, the the understanding that we have that they are so strong is completely emptied at the very words of Jesus? The moment that he says, be still, it ceases. Jesus was going to teach his disciples something about who he was. And he wasn't going to do it in parables like we see in the rest of chapter 4. He wasn't going to teach them through life lessons. But rather, he was going to teach them by being in the storm with them. And perhaps this morning that you find, that's exactly where you find yourself, in a storm, in a trial. Maybe you were laid off during lockdown and wondering where the money will come from. Maybe you've lost loved ones during COVID and there's much left unsaid. Maybe lockdown has, in fact, revealed your true spiritual state before a holy God, and you feel destitute and alone. Our cry out to Jesus is very similar to that of the disciples. Do you not care about me? Do you not know what I'm going through? But based off of what happened in this moment, can I ask that we take a step back from our own response and really see what Jesus is trying to show them? Are we not too quick to ask God to remove us from these trials that we would face before we even ask him to help us to understand what he has to teach us while we're in them? It takes quite a lot of faith to ask that question. But what kind of faith? Well, if you're following the word closely in this passage, you'll see the word great is mentioned three times. Firstly, in verse 37, it is ascribed to the storm. Secondly, in verse 39, it is ascribed to the calm after Jesus speaks to the storm. And thirdly, it is used to describe the fear that overcame the disciples after the storm had ceased. Now, don't miss the contrast. Earlier, these disciples who were deadly afraid of the storm that they found themselves in, now here found themselves equally, if not more, afraid of the one who saved them. So what kind of faith can cast out this fear? What is the kind of faith that Jesus is rebuking his disciples for not having in verse 40? Well, their question is perhaps the most natural question that each of us would have asked in that moment. Who is this man? In the next chapter, from from the whole of chapter five, we're gonna see what I believe Mark tries to show us as an answer to this question. In the first place, Mark, from chapter five, verse one to 20, shows us Jesus victorious over evil. And Mark gives us the context for these first events in verse one to five. It's as they were approaching the other side of the sea, there was a man with spirit, a man with unclean spirit, who lived among the caves. And we're immediately told that he ran up to the boat. This man had such dark spiritual influence that he wasn't presented in a human way. Look at the kind of incredible strength that he had. He was able to break shackles and chains. 
It's really as though this man's humanity was being stripped away. He lived among the dead in the tombs. He lived among the animals of the wild. He was by the seaside, by himself, shunned from society. He sat day and night crying out and cutting himself. And here we see evil's goal. It is to destroy, it is to strip away the humanity that God made us in, the image of God. Mark Mark makes sure that we understand the situation, like with the storm, which none of the disciples through their best efforts could even hope to control, no one could control this man. Another unsolvable problem. But when Jesus arrived on the other side of the bank, there he was, this possessed man who had seen him coming from afar, and we pick up with the interaction at verse 6. This man who, was, who no one was able to subdue runs up to Jesus, and we're almost expecting a fight scene to come from the previous verses, but instead he falls on his face in front of Jesus, and he cries out using Jesus' divine title, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Now, perhaps you've watched the Hobbit movies uh, where you find Bilbo Baggins uh, afraid and always scampering around, and one of the moments is when he is confronted, confronted by Smaug the dragon while searching for the Arkenstone. In order to get out of the situation, he decides to use flattery. He decides to try and smuggle his way out of the situation using sneaky tactics by using the praise names of Smaug. Bulbo calls him Smaug the Stupendous, Smaug the Inaccessibly Wealthy, Smaug, cheap, chiefest of calamities and greatest of all. To see what's really happening in our passage, we must understand that the cultural context is not like today. In a similar sense, when parents want to shout at their children, they'll use the full name. But here, when this demon and when these demons are speaking to Jesus, their calling out using Jesus' divine title is not through respect. It is not in acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity. It is a sneaky, sarcastic plea for mercy from Jesus. Once again, we see the demon even attempting to use God against Jesus. Look at when he says, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. A modern translation would say, swear by God's name that you will not harm me. This tactic means nothing to Jesus because he was sent by his father. He is not at odds with his father. This demon cannot put Jesus against his father in order to try and work his way out of an unwinnable situation. So here we see a glimpse, a glimpse in the middle of this passage of a hope, an end time reality, an eschatological reality of one day that the demons know when they speak to Jesus as the son of the most high God, they are not lying about his title. It might be for their own gain, but they are truth telling. They are saying something which is a reality. We have evil standing in front of God in the flesh and it schemes, it shakes, it is petrified. And we have Jesus here veiled in in the fullness of humanity, completely God, unmoved, undeterred by the darkness. Or we go on in verse 11 to 13 to see evil's desire and its goal fully formed in front of us. And this is what makes sin so terribly sinful, is that evil's desire is to destroy. In Genesis, we see that God made mankind in his own image, and God calls his creation good. But when evil entered the world, it was because Adam failed to tend the garden, to keep the garden as God commanded him, and he let this talking snake come in and tempt them. But what made humans human is that they were created in the image of God. They were not beasts of the field, of the sea, or of the sky. They were image bearers. And what is the very first thing that Satan does? Knowing that he cannot physically harm Adam and Eve, he attempts to turn their understanding of who God is, and so shaping their reality. Look at what he does to Eve in convincing her to follow after her own passions, her own desires, to be obedient to her own will. She makes a God out of her own image in the garden, in the temple garden of God. And look at the effects of evil on humanity. 
people begin to look less like God, more like the wild beasts and the creatures of this earth. This is why sin looks so sinful. This is why man, this man is described in such beastly language. He is acting subhuman. Friends, evil wants to destroy. Paul writes about sin and evil in Romans 3, verse, 20, verse 10 and 11, and again in 23, when he says that there is no one good, no, not one, no one seeks after God, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This sin has affected each and every single one of us, and its desire is to break our image bearing this away. Friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that there is no one good? Do you believe that we have all sinned and fall short of a holy God? Do you believe what society would call ridiculous, and that is to say that there is no one good when compared to a holy God? In verse 11 to 13, we see a curious set of events. The demons enter into negotiations with Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you're left wondering at this point, what is it that we will see? How, how is this really going to be managed by Jesus? Is, the, is it going to turn into a fist fight? Are we going to see Jesus unveil his power and his authority and destroy these demons? But before we think about what Jesus' response will be, I'd like us to consider what we believe evil and sin to be. See, many of us think that because we are not what society considers the most evil, the shunnable, that we are not as devastated by evil as what this man is. The problem is, again, that evil's final goal is to destroy. If it can't destroy you directly, it'll attempt to destroy your view of God, a very powerful alternative. And isn't that what we see so much of today? Sadly, even in our own local churches. People who seem fairly good, helpful, loving, kind, caring, compassionate, yet people calling evil good and good evil. Now you might wonder why the demons pleaded to go into a herd of pigs. You might wonder why Jesus allows it. And you might ask why Jesus allowed these demons to enter the group of pigs and why he didn't just destroy them like they begged him not to. See, because of the corruption of sin and evil and its effect on our minds, altering our view of God, I believe Jesus' response here is a type of grace which none of us would choose for ourselves. Jesus allows devastation and evil to have its moment. He allows it to show its power and reveal its hand so that the people there, so that those witnesses then, so that we here today can see that there is no good in evil. It is impossible to see the result of this evil as anything but evil. We cannot fail to see another element of God's grace this morning. How long must this man have been in this bondage? How long must he have been tormented by demons for the countryside to know about this man at these caves on this shore? Either this is a sign of God's complete weakness and his lack of empathy, or a sign of his great plans and his sovereignty and control. Friends, as soon as Jesus sees, as soon as Jesus releases these demons into the pigs, notice the contrast, notice what happens to these pigs. We see in verse 13 that they rush down into the sea, their destruction is full force, and they are obliterated, they die immediately. So why not with the man? Why did the demons die? Why, the destruction of the, uh, why did the demons take these pigs to their destruction? Why not this man? Well, what kept the man from full and final destruction was grace. The kind of grace that meets every unbeliever here and around the world this morning who woke up. The kind of grace from God that brings about storms in our lives to point us to a greater need than merely making it through. If like me, you've seen all over social media the kind of Christian quotes that would suit the internet well but would not be found in the Bibles, would not be found in scripture to point us back to a true and living God, the kind of quotes that say, you know, you just need to be strong enough to get through it. Friends, if nothing else, these passages are showing that that is utter nonsense. 
Jesus is the strong one. We are not. Who is this man? Jesus is the one who demonstrates that when man is seemingly lost, when his humanity has all but been stripped away, when darkness seems to have completely taken control, when there is no good, no hope, when society has even let go of you, Jesus is the one who reaches in. The sovereignty of God, the power of God is demonstrated in Jesus as he reaches through the darkness, showing that there is nothing that will stop God from accomplishing salvation in his people. Not the darkness of the darkness, not evil of evil, not the sinfulness of humanity. Nothing will stop a holy God from reaching through the darkness, saving a people and saying peace into the hearts of broken people. I asked if you believe that there is no one good and that evil is truly evil, but I must also ask, do you believe this? Do you believe that God is completely powerful to save? Friends, if you did, how would you pray? How would you evangelize? What ministry in the church would you be a part of? How would you spend your time and your money and your resources? Christians, how would your life change today? if you believe that God truly did save. For anyone here this morning who does not yet believe, can we talk for a moment? Now you might think that I or anyone else doesn't really know much about your life and that might be true. You might think that we don't know how bad you are or how much sin you have. Can I plead with you this morning to look again at this passage? Jesus came to the person that no one wanted to the evil of evils of the town, to the broken of the broken, to the destitutes of the destitute, and he never backed away. He embraced with a kind of love that none of us can understand. He went to the ones who were broken. He reached out his hand. He healed when he touched. He cried peace where there was none. The same Jesus is calling to your heart this morning. What will your response be? In this, image, in this picture, sorry, in this event, we have a picture of two men. And we have this picture painted twice. In the first part, we have a demon-possessed man that no one wants, that society has shunned. His evil is even too evil for society. This broken individual, this beastly man, and Jesus. And everyone is afraid of the demon-possessed man. But by the time the story reaches the townsfolk, as they come and as they hear what has happened, as they learn for themselves about the power of Jesus, we have another image. This man, calm, peace of mind, sitting, fully clothed, and Jesus, who is now the one that is feared. If nothing else, this simply proves to us that hearing about the power of God, seeing miracles happen, is not enough for us to believe. Do you see a problem here? See, this man was pushed out of society, but the second Jesus healed him, the second his, his life no longer looked as bad as what society wanted away, they were happy to welcome him back in. But who are they afraid of? Jesus. They were afraid of a demon-possessed man, and now they're afraid of his savior. We must see a certain societal truth here that each of us, if we're Christians here this morning, that we must all understand for ourselves. You will be accepted by an evil people in an evil world as long as your evil looks familiar. What will not be tolerated, however, is Jesus. The kind of light and love that Jesus, the salt and light that he calls us to be in the world around us, that will not be tolerated. This people's fear causes them to chase off Jesus, their only hope of salvation, the only one that can help. And what is even more scary than their request in denying Jesus is Jesus' answer to their request. And he gives them what they want, a life without him. So who is this man? Well, in the second place, in verse 21 to verse 43, Mark shows us Jesus victorious over, over sickness and death. 
we join back in with Jesus again when he has crossed over to the other side of the sea and we're met with the, the typical inquisitive crowd of followers. Amidst the commotion, a single voice, one man penetrates the commotion. A leader of the local synagogue, Jairus. He comes when he sees Jesus and he falls at his feet. Notice the same posture as the demon. We're told in verse 23 that Jairus' daughter is sick, so sick, in fact, that she is almost dead. Now, I'm sure to many of us, especially during a time like COVID, where we have all, no doubt, known or ourselves lost loved ones, a story like this really rings home. See, he pleads with Jesus to come to his house, but there's a, there's a new detail that's introduced. We're told in verse 23, he asked Jesus, come and lay your hands on my daughter, that she may be made well and live. And I love to see what Mark has done. Again, in the Greek, the word for, for made well here is the word sozo, which means to save. And Mark is using wordplay here for us to be able to see that this man is asking Jesus, come and save my daughter so that she may be made well. Now, there's no proof or evidence for us to know that this is a salvific faith kind of saving, but the wording that Mark chooses to use here, I don't believe is a mistake. It's meant to show us what Jesus is doing. It should surprise us, however, that this religious leader, with access to, no doubt, the top healers, the faithful men and women of the countryside, of the whole land, chooses to go to this teacher. We're not told that he had tried anyone else, but clearly he was at the end of his rope, and he all, the only hope that he had left was in this wandering miracle worker. Notice the contrast in the previous events. This demon-possessed man, the chaos in his life. Similar to the kind of chaos that we find on the boat with the disciples. And then the peace that we find after Jesus speaks in the moment to the kind of peace that we're about to see in this passage. So what did the people want from Jesus? In our previous story, they wanted him to leave. And the heart wants what the heart wants. The natural man is inclined towards re the rejection of a holy God. We are sinful and our hearts are destitute. They're wicked above all things. They want nothing to do with the salvation that God offers. What did Jairus want? He wanted for Jesus to come and save. So why would he want that? Well, his eyes were clearly open to see Jesus for who he was as one who could save. And in seeing that, he decides to go to Jesus and to cry out to him. And notice that in each place, God gives the desire of the heart to both people. To the people that want to reject Jesus, God gives them over to their desires. And to those who seek after Christ, God gifts them salvation. And so Jesus goes to Jairus to see his dying daughter. Before Jesus reached his dying young daughter, we're told in verse 25 to 26 that a new situation emerged, a sickly woman who no one could help. In fact, it seems that everyone else had just made it worse. She approaches Jesus quietly and secretly. In verse 27, we're told why she was following Jesus. It says that she had heard the reports now, I'm not quite sure why the ESV translates it as reports. The wording there is simply she has heard about Jesus. And no doubt the, the story of Jesus healing a demon-possessed man was all the town gossip, at least for the last few hours. See, simply hearing was not enough. Likewise, this woman had not just simply heard. She had moved from hearing to doing this woman who had believed what she had heard, her belief and trust had taken her with the evidence of Jesus' power and authority to the source, to Jesus. She hadn't heard about his miracles and went to go hear about him some more. She went straight to Jesus. And if, like me, you grew up in a Christian home and you uh, heard the gospel from a young age, perhaps your household music was Keith Green and you watched the Gaithers sing along music nights, Perhaps you attended youth groups in Sunday school and you went to uh, different churches. Perhaps you have been involved in churches your whole life. Uh, you've even been baptized and you're a member in good standing. Can I ask you this morning, have you simply heard the gospel or have you believed? 
Has your hearing of the gospel translated into a following of Jesus? Or would a better way to describe you be as a faithful, pew-warming, loving, religious person who looks like a Christian, but in fact you wouldn't know Jesus? See, someone who knows Jesus trusts Jesus and follows Jesus. Yes, there are times in our lives when we follow after our own hearts and God by His grace draws us back to Himself. But this cannot be the norm from young to old. We cannot say that we are Christians, that we know Jesus and live a life that is contrary to the gospel. Too many people have been assured by well-meaning church folk that they are saved because they raised a, raised a hand, prayed a prayer, or went to the front of a church service once. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, verses which we all know. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. And we like to read those, but we forget verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If our faith does not result in following Jesus, then according to James, that faith cannot save. See, this woman walks up behind Jesus and she touches him. In verse 28, we see an echo of what Jairus, what Jairus asked Jesus to do with his daughter. With Jesus' touch, all could be made well. And this is exactly what we see here. In an instant, this woman is healed. And at this very moment, Jesus, knowing that power had gone out of him, looks into the chaos of the crowd and he asks, who touched me? And amidst the crowd, the soft-spoken woman comes forward with fear and trembling and she tells Jesus the truth. Something we must see here as Christians is the posture and the attitude of this woman, not just before she's saved, but afterwards. Not just before she's healed, but afterwards. Now there are many people who would consider following this Jesus, trying out religion in order to receive a certain life goal. You want to be rich and wealthy, healthy and happy, follow Jesus, be religious. That's what's preached on Christian TV at least. But the problem is as soon as this lifestyle becomes obtainable, what do we see? We see that this Christianity, this Jesus, this God stuff becomes a hobby which was once great, it served its purpose, but it can now be discarded. Friends, what are our attitude before a holy God? A God who has shown us grace and compassion beyond what we deserve. Is our life a reflection of God's goodness in shining out so that others may see God's grace? And Jesus' response here should humble us. There's no, you're welcome, there's no, why did you touch me? There's not even a, you should have come like Jairus. The compassion and mercy of God is on all who believe. From the weakest of the weakest who have no words but simply come in fear and trembling, clinging to the truth of who Jesus is and holding fast to him as their savior. And I plead with you this morning, if you find yourself in the midst of a storm, in the midst of trials, in the midst of the brokenness of a fallen world, cling to Jesus. Call out to Jesus, run to Jesus. He hears your prayers and he loves you. Jesus' response is, daughter, your faith has made you well. And here we see it again, go in peace. There's another clue here that separates these three stories from the next. And I mentioned it previously. With the storm, we were introduced to the kind of chaos and the brokenness of the world. And this demon-possessed man just really reflects it. And the peace that Jesus brings out of the storm is reflected right here in this woman's life. In the midst of an unchangeable, completely broken situation, someone who had nothing. She was clearly a wealthy woman. The passage tells us she spent all of her money to try and get well. Not even the physicians of the day could help. But Jesus says, peace. Mark is very intentional here. It's nothing other than the very works and the person of Jesus which brings peace and stillness into the heart of a broken world. We pick up again with the previous story at verse 35. And some of Jairus' house come and they tell a father the worst possible news. Your daughter has died. 
there are no more devastating words for a parent. There's no parent which would not give their last breath to ensure that their child was safe and well. And just hearing these words interrupts the moment. It completely breaks the mood. It completely shatters what had just happened to this woman. And you can imagine Jairus' response to these people. But out of the side, what do we see? We see Jesus responding, don't fear, believe. And there's something to be said about this contrast that Mark draws again between faith and fear, belief and fear, trust and fear. It's not simply that life without, fe- without faith is neutral. If you do not know Christ, you have a very real reason to fear life this morning. There are no certainties for you. There is no hope. But in Christ, it is a contrast. And it's not the kind of thing where we say as Christians that believe in the prosperity gospel that if you have faith, the circumstances don't matter. No, it is rather a trust in whom's hand the circumstances lie. See, faith doesn't ignore the situation. Rather, faith completely breaks out. It moves away. It shatters fear, not because of our ability to make it through the moment, but because it trusts in the one who is with us in the trial. Another detail which we mustn't miss here is that for Jesus to be touched by this woman with a discharge, sorry, jumping ahead, uh, their disbelief, these people's disbelief, Jairus's concern and worry in this moment was not enough to deter Jesus. So what do we see? We see Jesus moving to the house with this little girl. Now Jesus continues to say the most outrageous statement, and it's something we would expect to see on prosperity gospel TV channels or perhaps at a Bethel healing service. He says, this child is not dead, but sleeping. Can you imagine the reaction of the people there? Can you imagine your reaction as a parent? You have seen your lifeless child. You have seen the results of sickness. You have seen her dead. But what does Jesus do? He moves away from their responses. It doesn't concern him. He takes the parents, he takes his disciples, he goes into the room with the little girl, and walking up to her, he touches her, and he says, Talita kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. See, in an in- this instant must have felt like a lifetime for the parent, but for Jairus, the faith that he had in Jesus' ability to come and touch his daughter, to save her, to make her well, was not wasted. It's another detail here that we mustn't miss, is what it means for Jesus to have touched this dead body, as well as the woman with the bleeding discharge. Old Testament law tells us in Numbers chapter 19, verse 11, that anyone who touches a body will be unclean for seven days. And likewise, anyone who touches a woman with a discharge or the woman herself, they will too be unclean for seven days. This was a ceremonial uncleanness. And what it meant was that after a period of time, after you were clean, you would come to the temple and you would offer a sacrifice where blood had to be spilt. And the sacrifice was a reminder of the holy standard of God, which could only be met by the dying of all that was evil. And through that sacrifice, they could be made clean with God and not just physically. Here in these stories, we have Jesus touching a body. We have Jesus touching a woman with a discharge. And Jesus says that he hasn't come to break the law, he has come to fully obey the law. So what do we do with a Jesus who has just done what the Old Testament says should make him unclean? Instead of becoming unclean himself, because Jesus has no sin, he is not separated from God, he is not broken off in relationship from God. Instead, what we see is that when sin, when brokenness, when uncleanness comes into contact with Jesus, it is that sin, that brokenness, and that uncleanness which finds its healing. See, the greatest work of Jesus wasn't in these moments, but when Jesus responded to the will of his Father in full obedience, when he suffered 
the payment for, for sin and for evil, our brokenness on the cross, when he took that willingly, when he himself went to pay for that in our place, that we could be sons and daughters of God. That blood sacrifice was enough to make us clean. The same Jesus who could touch the broken, who could touch the unclean and not be made unclean himself, but instead heal, instead give life. That same Jesus is the Jesus that went to the cross for you and for me. But the great accomplishment of Jesus is also wrapped up in the story as he is the one who is victorious over sin and evil. He has defeated death for all who believe. When he says, little girl, arise, Talita Kumi, he is not only speaking to one person. This is what Jesus does in all of our hearts if we repent and believe. We are given new life. So the demon was right. Who is this man? Well, he is Jesus, the strong son of the most high God, powerful to save. Now, I believe Mark sets these orders in this, in this, sorry, I believe Mark orders these events in such a way for his disciples, for the disciples of Jesus to be able to see these things, for Christians afterwards to read these accounts, to see the answer to these questions. But the question is for you and for I this morning, all these years later, who is this man to you? Either he is who he says he is, Jesus, the son of the most high God, or he was a deranged lunatic. Those are the only two options. And can I plead with you this morning that if you have seen Jesus for who he is, and if you want to turn yourself over to him in faith and repentance, that you do so today. If you do know Jesus, If this morning you are a disciple of Jesus, if you follow after Jesus, let me leave you with the words that Jesus spoke to the man who was possessed by demons. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. This morning as we go in peace, remember that we who go have been forgiven much have been shown much mercy, and that the command for us is to take this knowledge of who is this man out to all who would hear. Our response is not to awaken the dead hearts of man. The power of the disciples was completely nothing. The disciple of healers in those times, nothing. The disciple of the religious leaders, nothing. The power of humanity, nothing. That doesn't change once we get saved. You and I have no power to save, but we have the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That is the message that we take out to a fallen and broken world. That is the message that we, during a time like COVID, that we must preach to a fallen world. That is the message that we should be speaking as we go home today. So again, I ask you, if you truly do believe that Jesus saves How will that change your life today? Let's pray. Oh God, we come into your presence this morning and we thank you. We thank you that we have been shown such mercy. We thank you that in sending your son to accomplish the finished work of salvation, there is a hope for us. We thank you for the reminder from your word that you, Jesus, are victorious over evil, over sin and even death. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy. And we stand in awe of you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Please go with us this morning by the Holy Spirit. Be with us. Comfort us through the trials. And if there's storms that we're going through, may we know your nearness and your presence. And we pray these things in the matchless name of the strong King Jesus with thanksgiving and praise. Amen.